Hello, this is Aaron Wren, and welcome back to the podcast. I have a very special guest today, a truly special guest, and that is Oz Guinness. He is an author and social critic, and yes, he is related to the Guinness Brewing family. He also has an incredible personal life story. He was born in China to medical missionaries, lived through the communist takeover of that country as a kid. He he has a DPhil from Oxford. He's been involved with many eminent institutions, ranging from the Brookings Institution to the Trinity Forum, which I believe he may have been involved in, in founding. He's also written many, many books, including Our Civilizational Moment, The Waning of the West, and The War of the Worlds, which is just out. There's a link to buy it in the show notes, and that we're going to talk about today. Mr. Guinness, thank you for joining. My pleasure, Aaron. Thanks for having me. And I think you have a copy of the book. You can hold it up to the uh, to the camera. People can see what it looks like there, so you know uh, what it is. That's a great... Uh, that's a great cover there. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time. What is a civilizational moment? It's a particular thing that needs to be defined carefully. It's not just a crisis. Every civilization rises through some inspiration, dynamic, some deep cause. But at a certain point in the rise, flourishing, and then decline of a civilization, a civilization loses touch with what made it great. And when that happens, it's not five minutes, it might be over a couple of centuries. When that happens, there are only three broad choices, renewal, replacement, or decline. A rather simple way of putting it. Now, of course, most civilizations in history declined. They're in ruins, Angkor Wat the Parthenon, the Colosseum, the Great Pyramid of Giza. They're in ruins or museums or history books. They declined. And our Western world, which is probably the most powerful civilization in history, simply because it's transforming the world and not simply part of the world, we are now at that point today. So that's the civilizational moment. Now, in terms of the West, clearly it was the Christian faith that made the West. So we owe a lot to the Greeks, something to the Romans, but it was the conversion of the barbarian tribes in Europe that made the West. And of course, most of the West has repudiated the Christian faith, certainly at the level of the intelligentsia, and enlightenment secularism has failed too, to be a replacement. That's why we're at this civilizational moment. What are some examples of previous civilizational moments so people can get a, a sense of what we're talking about? Well, the two best known for people in the West and certainly for Christians in the West, you can see in first in the Bible and then in the story of Rome. So the period of the late time before the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of Jerusalem in 587, 586, when prophets like Jeremiah were writing, that's a good example of a time because what made Israel was repudiated and they went to exile. And then, of course, you have really the, the fifth century and the great writer there is uh, St. Augustine describing the decline of pagan Rome and another civilization that met its end in that way. So those two periods are pretty well known. Of course, when you go back to the Sumerians and the Babylonians, the Egyptians, really only scholars know that. But the other two, we can know. It's interesting you bring up uh, Israel at the time of the exile, because I've just been reading Jeremiah. That's the book of the Bible that I'm going through right now, and he's is uh, quite uh, graphic prophecies about what is about to happen to them. If we think about Rome, it sounds like you're saying sort of Rome failed and then Europe emerged as a new thing. So I want to, I want to clarify, Rome didn't essentially find Christianity and reinvented itself. It sort of died and then a new Western civilization sprang in its place. Or how, how do you interpret that transition from antiquity to the Middle Ages? Now, Rome, in terms of the Western Empire declined and fell, and people say somewhere around 476, and that sort of a period. Of course, Rome itself had moved to Constantinople, 
and you have the Byzantine Empire, which lasted another thousand years. But Rome, as we know it in terms of the Western Empire, clearly collapsed. In terms of our society, how did we get to this civilizational moment? What caused Christianity to sort of lose its purchase on society? Oh, well, I think the rise of secularism in its, 19, in its 18th century Enlightenment form, which they summed up in one word as reason. But you can see a number of different impulses behind it. The, the first one, we don't want God. In other words, a key part of European secularization is revulsion against established and oppressive state churches. So you have the French Revolution most clearly, but the cry of Diderot, which is picked up by the Jacobin, we will never be free until we strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest. In other words, much of Enlightenment reason was a parasite on the best of Christian beliefs, but a protest against the worst of Christian behavior. And certainly my, my family is Irish. If you look at the sad story of the incredibly rapid secularization in Ireland in the last generation, much of it is against the backdrop of the corruption of the church, which is incredibly sad, the evidence from the orphanages and so on. Yeah, so you mentioned ancient Israel, and I, you know, reading Jeremiah, there's something of, of a sense in which that was God's judgment on them for turning their back on him. Do you think there was a sense in which some of this was either God's judgment or a withdrawal from grace, knowing that that's speculative? You know, there's a lot of like people are always interpreting the signs of the times and like, how should we think about that in terms of God when things like this start happening? Well, remember the biblical view of judgment, which I'm sure you have. A lot of people tend to think that the judgment is God sort of zapping us from a drone way in the sky if we do wrong. Whereas at the heart of the biblical understanding of, of judgment is God's leaving us or sometimes driving us to the logic of our own choices. And if we reject him and abandon him, at some point we've got to face the logic of the alternatives we're choosing. And as you know, that's constantly the stress in Scripture. Choose. Moses, I put before you life and death, evil and good. Choose life. Or Elijah and Mount Carmel and so on. You've got to choose between Baal and Yahweh, the Lord. And so it goes. Lincoln, you can't be a house divided cannot stand. You can't be half slave, half free. You've got to choose or you'll reap the logic of the alternative. So America today, the deepest polarization is between those who understand the country and freedom from the perspective of the biblical understanding coming out in the American Revolution, 1776, largely, but sadly not completely, biblical. And those who understand the country and freedom from ideas coming down from the French Revolution. Now, you can't be half 1776 and half 1789. They go in different directions. And if the Lord is judging us, he's leaving us today to the consequences of choosing ideas that are crazy, that are untrue, false, some of them insane, and they will lead to decline. To what extent are today's American Christians or European Christians themselves infected with a civilizational moment? Are we truly animated by Christianity as the mainspring of our own lives, or are we just sort of coasting on a sort of cultural inheritance that we're just behind the times and getting rid of? Like, well, How should we think about ourselves? Very much, I'm afraid, the latter so, you know, I think there are two main forces that are the challenge of modernity. One is secularism we've been describing. The other is secularization. The way the modern world tends to force us to the margins and make our faith less meaningful for the whole of life. So faith becomes, as Theodore Rajak said way back in the 60s, privately engaging, 
publicly relevant. Now, that's a body blow to the lordship of Christ over the whole of society, which is the heart of being salt and light in society. So a huge amount of faith today is more worldly than it is close to the word. And of course, as such, it's weak. We are weak because we're worldly. You mentioned one of the options is that this mainspring that, that is no longer animating society is replaced by something else. Is there like a would-be successor or successors to Christianity in our society? Well, clearly the Enlightenment secularism claimed to be that. God was dead, revelation unnecessary, but we still had reason and we could make progress. As I said, they were a parasite on our best. They did all the same things as before, but without the Lord. Now, if you look at the history of secularism over 200 years, you can say it's now its victory was Pyrrhic. They won the argument in the intellectual circles, and there's almost nowhere in the major universities now where the Christian faith would be decisive or dominant. They won in the intellectual circles. But you can see secular has its own. They produce reason in one, in one word. Re no. They produce, say, in postmodernism, the most thoroughly irrational views. So even reason itself, logic, truth, these are, quote, white truths, and so on. But then again, as many have pointed out from Christopher Dawson down, in that bid to be anti-religious and thoroughly secular, godless self-gods, as Heinrich Heine described Marx, godless self-gods, they've produced ideologies which are on the surface anti-religious, but actually quasi-religious, profoundly religious, and very dangerously religious, in their oppression, such as Nazism, Marxism, and so on down the line. But now, of course, you have, say, with superintelligence and AI, secularists beginning to wonder if they've replaced themselves. The selfless self-gods have produced with generative AI something that could well replace them in the future. In other words, we're close to Goethe's Sorcerer's Apprentice, or whatever. So there are very few people now who think that Enlightenment secularism and its heirs is the real answer. And you can see in America, teenage addictions, teenage suicides, there's no meaning. You know, every human being requires three simple things. You know this well, Aaron, as a mm. social scientist. Meaning, belonging, and purpose. And secularism does a rotten job in answering those three, whereas, of course, the Christian faith is the most profound answers to those three. I'm curious what there's, I didn't see this in your previous work. At, so I don't know if you, what you think of this trend, but it does seem like there's been a, a lot of talk lately and a lot of ferment in the culture around this idea of reenchantment. I think a lot of people are uh, dissatisfied with the secular answers, dissatisfied with the ideological answers. So we see them turning to things like psychedelic drugs to try to connect uh, with the spiritual. They go on an ayahuasca trip or they uh, do different things. Uh, the writer Rod Dreher has a book uh, about reenchantment. It does seem like there's something there where people are searching for a kind of spirituality that they're missing. It's not the Christian faith. Uh, do, what do you think? Of, what do you see going on in the culture with that? Oh, absolutely. Actually, that, that theme has been in my book since the beginning. Okay. Okay. The first book on the dust of death, which was a critique of the 60s, goes into the way people were turning to the Eastern religions and to psychedelics as an answer. And my last but one book is on signals of transcendence and how many people are now going back to the supernatural through experiences like that and so on. So I, I believe what you're saying is very, very important. I put much of it under the head of often, you know, when G.K. Chesterton is quoted or misquoted sometimes, when people don't believe in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. 
And clearly there's a deep desire to find something else. Now, much of it is very trivial. And much of it, if you take the deeper philosophical and religious answers, like Hinduism and Buddhism, leads in the wrong direction. So you can't say have a high view of human dignity and purpose if you look at Hinduism. I studied under a guru once. And uh, what is freedom and purpose, say, in Hinduism? Well, you put it in two words. Forget it. Why? If you pursue your own individual growth and fulfillment and purpose, you're caught in the world of maya, an illusion. And the goal is for you to lose yourself. And freedom means, in Hindu, moksha, release. You release all this and go back and join as the rivers flow in the sea and a salt merges in the water, you go back to becoming one with the ground of being, an impersonal understanding of God. So it's very different, and it leads in a very different direction. So as you know, there's a lot of sloppy ecumenism around, and I love insisting, differences make a difference. And we need to look carefully at what all the differences are and where they lead. One of the things you mentioned is all of these different waves, which I would interpret somewhat as different attempts to replace Christianity with something else. And so you could think of the secularism, you could think of communism, a sort of red wave. There's also uh, the sexual revolution, the rainbow wave. When mm -hmm. I look at American culture, it seems that some of these got more traction than others. So kind of a, a pure secularism seems to only appeal to very intellectual people. Uh, the average person can't really relate to that kind of view of the world. Communism never really caught on in America, at least not in its um, original form. But mm -hmm. the sexual revolution seems to be quite popular. Uh, so we see that uh, sort of even at kind of the folk or the, the demos level, if you will, the majority of Americans want abortion to be legal for example. They're probably very satisfied with this. Are there certain characteristics of these things that appeal more or less to different people? Well, I think, one, you need to look why they appeal, and two, to see where there's a vulnerability in culture that they can exploit. So, Marxism, whether classical or cultural, their revolutions never succeed, their oppressions never end, and their promises never are fulfilled. But what's the great appeal of much of Marxism? Liberation and a view of the future. And people are attracted by that. Now, of all the great views of the future, there's nothing like Judaism and the Christian faith and the biblical view of the future, but somehow we don't talk of that in, in a powerful way. Or take the vulnerability you know, the um, great Swiss historian Jakob Burkhardt says, if you lead evils and wrongs unaddressed, they will lie below the surface of the ground, rather like a bomb from the previous war. And then any innocent can stumble across it and blow themselves up, or an enemy can ignite them and set them off. Well, if you look at that, colonialism in Europe is Europe's great vulnerability. Race and slavery in America is America's great vulnerability. And so, despite the extraordinary advances of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement addressing the Jim Crow era and all of that, there was still a lingering residue of guilt and guilt feelings, and that's what the radical left knew that they could exploit all too easily. Now, when you take the sexual revolution, I'm laughing because you can go back to the architect. It was Wilhelm Reich who gave us the term, the sexual revolution. It goes back way before him, but he wrote in the 1920s and 30s. And he says, in effect, you know, this is going to be relatively an easy sell because it's much easier to jump in and out of bed than it is to mount a barricade. In other words, there's a cost. You can see that in Les Miserables, mm -hmm. those who mounted the barricades. You know, if you take to the streets in protest, it's much more costly than a permissive lifestyle. But do they achieve the liberation of all desire, which they talk about? Or do they achieve free love? 
nonsense. They've destroyed love and the hookup culture. And now they're turning against sex altogether. You can see it doesn't work. You mentioned that at the time of, of the Enlightenment in France, there certainly was an abusive church. There was an abusive sort of monarchy and nobility in the country. When I look at 19th century world, the, the early industrial revolutions did produce a lot of very bad things and a lot of very bad conditions. Uh, I read a guy like Marcuse, and although I don't share any of his values, that guy was smart. And he actually made some pretty incisive criticisms of essentially American consumer culture. Are there things that these critics got right that we should reflect on? Are they maybe exposing some bombs that we need to address or should have addressed? Oh, of course. And say much. I remember my first visit to Berkeley, 1968, where I met Mario Savio, the leader of the free speech movement. Much of their revolt against the inhumanity, say, of the rise of industrialism and corporation world and so on. It was right. And you have examples today. I just had something from a friend who was treated very, very badly by a corporation. And you can see many of these things today. So we of all people, as heirs of the prophets, I love the fact, you know, people say, why didn't humans with the incredible oppression of power down through history, speak out. And probably the simplest great answer is that humans are impressed by power. There's a spectacle of power. It can be an athlete like LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Usain Bolt or a great conqueror like Caesar or Napoleon. They're awesome in some way, and we bow to it. The, the greatest, or the first great voices against the abuse of power, the prophets, and that's what we should be today. Unlike our postmodern friends, we believe in truth. And truth is the antidote to power, because power not only oppresses the weak, it corrupts the powerful. And we as followers of Jesus have that leverage in truth to be able to resist power in whatever form. So yes, we can learn from Marcuse and even from Marx himself at some points, but their solutions were infinitely worse than their diagnosis, and that's the problem. Oh, for sure. You start to get at that here, um, get at something here, which is e even within our lifetimes, although we were well into the civilizational moment, Christianity was still publicly held in honor. And that is really no longer the case in America. In some respects, Christianity is now kind of disfavored or at least viewed suspiciously Christian morality is expressly repudiated. Uh, in some ways, Christianity is seen as sort of a threat to the new public moral order. This has been profoundly dislocating to American Christians. How do you think we should respond to the, to the cultural conditions that we're encountering? Well, first, we've got to understand what's gone wrong, because what you're describing is the radical left's gaslighting of the whole of Western, or in America's case, American history. So rather than say Tocqueville saying it's the religion is the first of the American political institutions, it is now the hegemon, the uh, genocidal or the racist power and so on, patriarchal and so on. So we've got to understand where this comes from. The so-called long march through the institutions and how it has won the day and is now describing even the past. So we need to look at it. Very few people look at it big picture. There's a lot of what I call whack-a-mole politics. Protest here, scandal there, outrage over here. You, you can answer them. No, no. You've got to look, why has it gone wrong? So great leaders define reality and set up the choice their people have to make. Like Lincoln, like Elijah, like Moses, like Churchill. We don't have a leader like that today. So we've got to understand first what's gone wrong. But secondly, in America's case, America has a freedom like no other, which comes from Exodus and Deuteronomy. And it's remarkable how very few American Christians can defend the idea that the best of the American experiment, the Republic, 
comes out of the Hebrew Republic and why it did so through the Reformation, through the 17th century, and so on. So you just take one simple idea. The U.S. Constitution is the American equivalent of the Jewish covenant. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means certain practical things, beginning with the fact you have the consent of the governed. That's where that notion came from, the consent of the government, which you have in the Declaration of Independence. Very few Christians know how to defend that. Or, mm. or and take another simple example. The framers didn't defend democracy. They built a republic, not a democracy. But if you talk about democracy, which we can, what's the most famous thing? saying, clearly, Lincoln at Gettysburg, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Terrific. But how many American Christians know Lincoln was quoting? He knew he was quoting, wasn't original. He was quoting a pastor in Boston. The pastor was quoting John Wycliffe, who in 1384, I think it was, in Oxford, said, if we bring the Bible back to ordinary people out of the hands of the priests and the clergy alone, then you can have government of the people by the people for the people. In other words, the Bible, you know, the Hebrew word Torah mm -hmm. means instructions, guidelines. You have the way of living, so you can have the possibility of self-governance. You know, that's an incredibly important idea today over against Davos, and global government and one world government, we've got to fight for self-government as well as national government, as well as global government. But these ideas are in the Bible, but very, very few Christians know that or know how to defend it. We have, we are the champions and guardians of the best news ever. You know, my own longing, my own daily prayer is that we'll have an awakening in the West where we're not doing well, and adjoining hands with our sisters and brothers throughout the rest of the world, so that together, over against the axis of evil authoritarianism, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and so on, we can work together as Christians, along with our friends, the Jews, towards what I call a human-friendly future. But the alternative to that is bleak. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about that future? Hopeful. <laughs> In other words, again, going around this country, I don't know about you, but when people use optimism or pessimism, it's often either a matter of the market, are you bullish or bearish, or a matter of psychology, is the glass for you half empty or half full? No. I think as followers of Jesus, we're always realistic. We look reality in the white of the eye. Things are bad at the moment. But there are all sorts of reasons why we are still people of hope, and above all, because God is sovereign. But if you take, say, what we're talking about, civilizational moment, the natural pairing, if you're a secularist, is decline and fall. You know what declines? Falls. You can believe in fate, like the ancients did, or determinism, like modern atheists do. But Decline leads to fall, period. That's not the biblical pairing. Yes, decline and fall, but the biblical counter is exile and return. So exile, if you leave the way of the Lord, you will reap cultural disorder. No question. Adam and Eve are east of Eden. Cain was a wanderer. Israel was in Babylon. Church is in a disastrous state today. But in the Bible, exile leads to, and doesn't lead to, can lead to, return. And for me, it's wonderful. Moses says that to the Jews even before they get to the promised land. You will leave the Lord, you will be in exile, but if you return to the Lord, he will return to you and restore your fortunes. So you have Ezra and Nehemiah who saved Judaism. You think of the first and second great awakenings, how the first awakening, my own great-great-grandfather who founded our family brewery, he came to faith under John Wesley in the first awakening. Of course, over here, the great American Revolution owes a huge amount to the first awakening. So I am hopeful and pray daily 
for revival and reformation and an awakening. My whole life sort of organized Christian religion in the United States has been fighting back against all these trends in the culture. Uh, you know, I going back to like at least the 1970s when I start being able to remember this stuff. And as near as I can tell, it's been a total failure uh, or or close to it. What would you suggest in terms of a change of tactic or what do we need to do differently if we've gotten such bad results? <laughs> well, I would say not failure, but no success so far. Yeah. But for me, the challenge is, on the one hand, recognizing what only God can do. So Jews and Christians together believe in the Messiah. And the heart of that is, at a certain point, the challenges of humanity and history will be beyond humanity. And if God didn't step in through his chosen one, we'd be in trouble. But he will step in one day. And of course, at a lesser level, revival now in the history of the church is like that. There are things that we simply can't do. And we should recognize freely, Lord, we can't change certain things. We know we can't above all ourselves. And so we have to look to you and to the power of your spirit. So revival is that. But then you take the way we're entering the world, as you probably know, one of my favorite themes is calling. And you know, the essence of calling means for followers of Jesus, everyone, everywhere, in everything. So the problem with American Christians isn't that they aren't where they ought to be. It's that they're not what they should be, right where they are. And too many Christians, you, you take, say, the current election next week, too many are in, disengaged altogether. And that's a huge problem because the American Republic which largely owes everything to the Hebrew Republic, every Jew is responsible for every Jew. And we, the people, every American citizen is responsible for the American Republic. And not to engage, in this case for vote, is a failure of discipleship, but also a failure of citizenship. But at the other extreme, you have other Christians who since the 1970s, you know, I first came here, Christians are relatively out of it. And remarkably, most Christian, most evangelicals slept through the 1960s. It was only in 73, Roe v. Wade and then Jimmy Carter and Chuck Colson and so on, they started to engage. But without a Christian worldview, they plunged into politics as anyone else would and became politicized. And we've made evangelicalism toxic, which is a huge tragedy. And so we've got to clean up the way we engage in the modern world. But, you know, if we follow the biblical pattern, discipleship, calling, salt and light, we again will be very powerful. But as I said, we need to begin. There are things only the Lord can do. Well, with that, uh, I think, admonition, uh, we will conclude today. My guest has been Oz Guinness. He's the author of the book, Our Civilizational Moment. There's a link to buy it in the show note. Mr. Guinness, thank you so much for joining. My pleasure, and thank you.